All right. Well, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, 50 minutes, something like that, we're going to talk about some legal pitfalls that occur in acute coronary syndrome. How many of you have ever walked into a shift and heard this phrase, remember that patient you saw last night? Anyone? And that's usually not followed by, oh, they just dropped off a gift basket for you, right? <laughs> so it's never, never think something that you want to you want to say to your colleague unless something really disastrous did happen. Well, when it comes to acute coronary syndrome, that is one of the big fears that we always face in, um, in emergency medicine. And so in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about two very, very simple objectives. The CME objectives that we submit are a little bit more intricate, but the reality is there's only two simple objectives for this talk. Number one, we're going to talk about what you need to know to better protect your patient. But also, as we know, that every time there's a provider interaction with the patient, there's actually two people at risk, right? There's the patients at risk, but then we're at risk also, uh, especially in this medical legal climate that we live in. So we're also going to spend a little time talking about what you need to know to better protect yourself as well, yourself, your hospital, and your colleagues. Now, I do have two rules of cardiology that I want to introduce you to right from the start. And in fact, what I would suggest to you is that if you're unwilling to accept these two rules that I'm going to show you, I recommend actually that you just leave for about 50 minutes, go play the casino or something like that, and then just come back in about 50 minutes because you're going to end up very dysphoric with some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. Rule number one, you can't diagnose every case of acute coronary syndrome, no matter how good you think you are. Rule number two is you can't change rule number one. Again, no matter how good you are, you can work in the latest, greatest, most technologically advanced hospital and have every bit of technology, electron beam CT, nuclear medicine scans for everybody, 80 lead EKGs, and they actually exist. But you're still going to miss some cases of acute coronary syndrome. The very best studies out there say that we're still missing maybe about 1%, maybe 2% of cases of acute coronary syndrome we're sending home. So no matter how good you are, there's still gonna be some misses, so you need to know in those rare cases what you can do to better protect yourself, all right? Why is this important? Well, we know that acute coronary syndrome is high risk, as we talked about yesterday. This is one of the things that, to me, really defines what emergency medicine is all about, where it's a condition where if you play your cards right and do everything right, there's a really great outcome, but if you don't do things well, there oftentimes is a really terrible outcome that can occur, and terrible outcome can result in patient death as well. All right, and then the, med, the, the lawyers get involved and they, they mess up everything. Um, from the, the standpoint of MedMal, ACS accounts for 20% of all the money that we pay out in this specialty. So it's the single entity that's responsible for the largest amount of money that we pay out in this specialty amongst all diseases, even compared to missed meningitis, missed appendicitis, and so on. All right? The majority of cases of acute coronary syndrome involve problems in the history. All right? And then a, a minority, a significant minority, relates to misdiagnoses that occur with regards to the electrocardiogram. So we're going to talk about both of those two topics. We're going to talk initially about problems that occur in the history and what we can do to improve on that. And then we're going to talk at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about electrocardiography. So first of all, let's get started by talking about the history. Why are we missing this? All right. Why are we making mistakes with regards to the history? We all learn how important history is. All right. Well, number one, failure to do and to document a good history. This is something that I'm starting to see more often in depositions where the lawyers will actually just simply confront the defending physician and say, doctor, didn't you learn that history is really important? Or why, you know, did everybody here learn that history is important? HPI is a cornerstone of diagnosis. Why is history important? Somebody shout out, why is history important? Who cares? Why do we have to do history? Just sit in your chair, order troponins and EKGs, and let the computer do it. Why do we have to do a history? Right? Because it helps clarify the diagnosis. History is very, very important, right? Everybody learn that? How many people learn this mnemonic, OPQRST, with regards to the HPI? So a lot of people, what do these stand for? Onset, uh, precipitating factors, quality, radiation, and what I've seen the uh, attorneys do is they'll just say, doctor, why did you learn that onset is really important? Why did you learn that precipitating factors are important to ask about? Why did you learn that it's important to ask about radiation? What are you going to say? Well, of course, because it helps clarify the diagnosis, 
All right. Well, the next question, of course, comes, did you document that on your chart? And the answer invariably is no. Otherwise, I wouldn't ask. Did you document that? And every time there's something that you should have asked but wasn't documented on the chart, it just makes you look bad. Because all of us have learned from our professors that it's all about history, history, history. We've learned how important the history is, and they put this chart up in front of the jury, and they show all the things that are missing in the documentation, right? In other words, you're not a thorough physician. You're not a thorough provider, PA, NP, whatever, whatever level of practice you are, right? And it just makes you look bad. Right. I've had this happen to me. Now, one of the mnemonics that I teach to all of our residents and students for the past 25 years is this old car mnemonic, old car. And I recommend that every one of our students and residents go through the old car mnemonic with every patient they see who's got pain, especially chest and belly pain. Ask about onset, location, duration, character. Is it sharp, dull, um, pressure, and so on? What makes the pain better? What makes it worse? Al alleviating and aggravating factors. What were the associated symptoms? Shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, and so on. And then what was the activity at onset? And then you ask about radiation. So I've taught this old car to many, many, many people over the years, and it's shown up in lectures and on the internet. And the last time, well, not the last time, but a couple of times I've shown up to depositions where they pull out this mnemonic and they say, Dr. Matu, I understand you teach old car. Why do you teach old car? Well, because history is really important, right? So what does old car stand for? Onset, location. Why do you teach about onset? Uh, why do you teach onset? Because it's helpful at distinguishing between, for example, dissection, which is sudden onset, versus ACS, versus something else. And they go one by one. Doctor, did this physician document onset on the chart? No. Did this physician document the location of pain? Did this physician document whether the pain radiated or not? No, no, no. And so I'm, I'm the defense expert trying to help this physician, and one by one, they're, they're making me pick apart this other person's chart because these things are not documented, all right? It's such a simple thing to do to document a good history, but so often it's not done. And I promise you that if any of you end up in litigation, there's a really good chance they're gonna start doing this to you. Don't let your chart hang you out to dry. You know, here's the way to think of it, right? Your chart is going to be the actual evidence that gets used against you, and yet you get to create this evidence. Why wouldn't you create evidence which is going to help protect you? So you've got to document a good history on that chart. Otherwise, it just makes you look very, very inadequate and very incomplete. And what I would say, in my experience, juries are completely willing to accept that physicians are not perfect. Juries are willing to accept that physicians can be wrong. Juries are not willing to accept that physicians cut corners or are incomplete. All right? So you've got to be thorough in what you do. Right? Now, we all know that we don't document everything that we do, and, and that's a fair statement. We don't document every single thing that you do, but when it comes to your HPI, you've got to document all those positives, the pertinent positives, and the pertinent negatives. All right? And remember that all of these accelerated diagnostic protocols, the heart score, how many of you use a heart score? Heart score, or a Timmy score, or a DAP score, all of these, all of these validated diagnostic protocols, they all include history every one of them. There is no validated, uh, validated risk stratification system which excludes history and just says, ah, just get an EKG and send the troponin. Every one of them includes the history. And in the heart score, which has become the most popular uh, accelerated diagnostic protocol used probably worldwide at this point, the heart score, one out of the five components is history. The H in heart stands for history. 20% of your score is history. And if you're not documenting a good history from the standpoint of the attorneys and juries, oftentimes they don't believe you did a good history. You cut corners and they don't like that. All right? Okay, moving on. What's the most common misdiagnosis in a chart in which ACS was, was missed? What's the most common misdiagnosis sitting on the chart of say a malpractice case in which ACS was missed? Shout something out. GERD, exactly, reflux, reflux esophagitis or gastritis is by far the most common misdiagnosis sitting on the chart of a malpractice case for a missed ACS. Why is that? Why is it so easy to mistakenly call things reflux? Well, 
from the cardiology literature, up to 50% of patients that are having ACS report an increase in belching during their cardiac ischemia. Maybe that's from diaphragmatic irritation from inferior MIs. I don't know. That's what I would guess. 50% of patients will report an increase in belching. 20% of patients use the words burning or indigestion. They don't read the textbook. They don't say the words they're supposed to use. They're supposed to say tightness or squeezing, or they're supposed to say an elephant sitting on my chest. Not once have I ever had a patient tell me an elephant was sitting on my chest, all right? I don't know any patients who have actually known what it feels like to have an elephant sitting on their chest, all right? But the textbooks say that's what they're supposed to say. Instead, they use the words burning or indigestion, which makes it very easy to mistakenly call it reflux. 15% of patients get complete relief, partial or complete relief, when they take some Maalox, all right? So they take the Maalox, it goes away, or it gets better, uh, it's got to be reflux. I've coded two people in my career who still had the white chalky junk from Maalox around their lips, because they took some Maalox thinking it was reflux, or the doctor gave them Maalox, and they ended up having a bad outcome. They ended up coding. When I was working at um, one of our community affiliates years ago when a patient was in a doctor's office upstairs on one of the higher floors and got sent down to the emergency department in cardiac arrest. And as I opened his mouth to intubate him, I saw all the white Maalox that his doctor had just given him. And when the doctor sent him down to the emergency department, he said, my patient had anaphylaxis to Maalox. No, it wasn't anaphylaxis. <laughs> he was having reflux, and you gave him Maalox. He was having a, car, a heart uh, ACS, and you gave him Maalox. No, I've seen that happen twice, actually. All right, be very, very careful about that. All right, 8% of patients report their pain began during a meal. It's a very large European study. They looked at over 10,000 patients that had had MIs, and they said, what were you doing when the pain began? 8% of patients were sitting down eating a meal. You know, Mr. Jones was eating some spicy jambalaya when his pain began. Oh, it's got to be reflux, right? Be very, very careful about that. And then the GI literature also reports that true GERD coexists with ACS more frequently in the same patient. So a lot of patients with cardiac, cardiac disease have GERD and vice versa, which just makes things even more difficult. The bottom line is be very careful. Before you ever write, I tell the residents, before you ever write reflux on the chart of a patient who came with chest pain that you're about to discharge, do yourself a big favor and just slap yourself, all right? Because if, if you don't, somebody else will. Maybe it's gonna be one of those attorneys that slap yourself. This is painful to watch, let me go back. So we'll just be, again, and I'm not gonna tell you GERD doesn't exist, but I'm just gonna tell you, before you ever discharge somebody with a diagnosis of reflux, just think twice. That's all, all I'm going to ask you to do. Just think twice that maybe it's not GERD. Maybe this is one of the many cases of ACS that's going to end up being misdiagnosed. So really think twice about that. All right. Next pitfall that is very, very common, failure to appreciate ACS in young patients. Now, when I was in medical school, I was taught that to have a heart attack, you either need to be a 55-year-old man or a 65-year-old woman. When I got to residency, they said, no, that's wrong, drop it, 10 years. It's a 45-year-old man, 55-year-old woman. And then I came out of residency and I started routinely seeing people in their 30s and now in their 20s. How many of you, just in this audience here, how many of you have seen a patient who had a STEMI, no cocaine, we're not talking about cocaine or congenital problems, but a true STEMI in a person in their 20s. Raise your hand. All right, so for the younger docs, look at all these hands that are going up. Keep your hands up really high. All right, shout out the youngest age that you've, you've had. And 17, can we break 17? 21, all right, any other teenagers? So, what's that? 19. All right, and that's becoming more and more common. I've asked this question to many audiences over the years, and in every audience I speak to, there's now always teenagers. There's always people in their teens, and, and way more than 50% of the audience will raise their hand for people in their 20s. It's become very, very common. It's not at all uncommon. How is this happening? Well, again, we've all been taught age over 55. There are studies that have shown that a lot of young people have ACS. Now, these numbers right up here are probably about 10, 15 years old. And don't assume that these are all cocaine users, because in these studies, they get rid of cocaine users. Anyone with a positive cocaine drug screen, they just put them out of the study. So this is true ACS in people that are not using drugs, all right? Um, there's actually studies from the 1950s and 1960s demonstrating young, healthy men and these are usually men that are involved in these studies. We'll talk about women in a little bit. Documenting that 
ACS was occurring back in the 1950s and 1960s. Pathologists have known about this for years. What do they say about the pathologists? Pathologists know everything, just a day too late. <laughs> um, so, but back in the 1950s and 60s, soldiers that were killed in the Korean and Vietnam Wars had autopsy. Now think about this for a second. These are young, healthy men in the prime of their life, right? 18, 19, 20 years old. They're running around the battlefield with 50-pound backpacks on their back. These are incredibly healthy young men. They get killed in combat, and autopsies that were done on a lot of these soldiers showed significant atherosclerotic disease back in the 50s and 60s. Let's move forward to 1990s. Here's a study from 1993 where they looked at over 100 patients that were killed in inner-city gang fights gang-related uh, gang incidents, average age 26 years old, all right? And they had autopsies, and what they found, average age 26, was that three-quarters of them had significant atherosclerosis. 9% more than 75% nearing, 20% had multi-vessel disease, average age 26 years old. And this is years before our god-awful diet, Western diets that we have now, all right? Here's a study from 2005 looking at 1,000 patients aged 24 to 39. Cocaine users, once again, excluded. 98% available for 30-day follow-up. And what they found was that 5% ruled in for ACS. 2% had adverse complications, including death or need for bypass surgery or PCI. Again, ages 24 to 39 years old. And it's only getting worse. You, those of you that take care of pediatric patients know what kids are eating nowadays. Those of you that have kids know what kids are eating nowadays. Childhood obesity rates are skyrocketing. Michelle Obama made it a national campaign to fight childhood obesity, right? So something that even made it up to the White House. Childhood inactivity. The pediatric cardiologists are predicting we're gonna be seeing more kids with atherosclerotic disease in their teens than ever before. Here's a staggering thing to think about. This is the first generation in human history where our kids are not expected to outlive their parents. This is the first generation in human history where kids have a shorter lifespan than their parents. It's never happened before, all right? And how common is atherosclerotic disease? Take a look at this. In 2009, pediatricians wrote 2.8 million prescriptions for, for cholesterol drugs. Those of you that don't do primary care pediatrics may have no idea about this, but that's how bad it is. About eight years ago, eight or nine years ago, there was actually a national debate that was staged uh, in the pediatric community between the APA, American Pediatric Association, and the cardiologists about whether we as a society should now be routinely starting kids on statins. Right? And, and the peds cardiologist weighed in and said, you know what, it's probably a little bit too early. And yet, despite that, 10 years ago, millions of kids are already started on statins, and it's only gotten worse since then. And so the peds cardiology community is predicting that in the coming decade, we're going to be seeing more teens than ever before having true atherosclerotic MIs. So don't ever discount your risk just because somebody is, quote, too young to have cardiac disease. Just to really hammer this home, there's a handful, this is just a smattering, like 10% of the cases that I've seen or, or been sent to me of people in their 20s with massive MIs, this is sent to me, 27 years old, the physician who referred this patient to Dr. Sacchetti actually thought the patient had pericarditis. Dr. Sacchetti diagnosed this patient with the big anterior STEMI, 27 years old. He had no known cardiac risk factors at arrival after his diagnosis, then they found some cardiac risk factors. Here's a 30-year-old that I think I showed you guys yesterday during the pericarditis discussion. The cardiologist thought this was pericarditis simply because the patient was 30 years old. The physician picked up on the fact that ST depression in AVL, this is an inferior wall STEMI, right? Here's a 24-year-old who decided to try to go work out. The patient had a couple cardiac risk factors and ended up with an, a big anterior wall STEMI. Here's a 29-year-old, HIV is the risk factor here. HIV is an independent risk factor for premature atherosclerosis, if you didn't know that. Massive MI, 29 years old, 25-year-old with a couple risk factors, big anterior wall MI. Here's a 23-year-old police officer who's a bodybuilder. His risk factor was that he was using anabolic steroids. He had a massive MI, went to a local emergency department in California and died of cardiogenic shock right there in the emergency department. 
otherwise healthy guy, had, except for the fact that he was using anabolic steroids. Here's a 26-year-old with the big 100% LAD. Case after case after case after case of people in their 20s, and also I'm hearing now about teenagers. The youngest I've seen is 21. One of my colleagues had a 19-year-old. Another colleague had a 12-year-old with this demi. This 12-year-old kid went into his parents' bedroom at night, diaphoretic with chest pain, and parents took him to a local emergency department where they diagnosed a big anterolateral STEMI. And in this local emergency department in West Virginia, they didn't know what to do, so they flew him out to D.C. where he went to the cath lab at D.C. Children's Hospital and was seen there by the peds cardiologist and the adult cardiologist from, the, from across the street at Washington National Medical Center. And so the peds and adult cardiologist went together in the cath lab and found that this kid was having a massive MI. And, and today he lives on calcium channel blockers and beta blockers with an EF of about 30%. This is about 15 years ago. Right. There is no age under which you no longer have to worry about ACS. Right. All right. Next up. All right, any questions so far, actually? Oh. All right. I mentioned yesterday, I like collecting signs, so I'm going to intersperse signs every now and then if, if you guys have any questions. Okay, next up, let's talk about ACS in women. Now, this is the classic picture. I think if I mentioned, think of... Uh, Think of ACS in women. This might be the picture you think of an older woman who's clutching her chest. The reality is this is often not the most common scenario that we see. Instead, what we're seeing more and more are relatively young women, oftentimes with atypical locations for their pain. Isolated abdominal pain, isolated arm pain, upper back pain, oftentimes not even a painful presentation, but instead presenting with shortness of breath. And over the past few decades, there's been dozens and dozens and dozens of articles that have been written talking about ACS in women. These are just some of the past few years, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. These are some articles from earlier this year already and consistently talking about atypical presentations in women and the frequency with which we're missing ACS in women. And in my little consulting practice of med mal stuff, I've been doing this for about 15 years, I would say without exaggeration, two-thirds of the cases that I see for missed ACS are women in their 40s and 50s. The very patients that I would never have thought are at risk, premenopausal women. Two-thirds of the cases in the med mal arena that I'm seeing are relatively young women who oftentimes presented very atypically. All right, atypical presentations oftentimes include painless presentations. I mentioned yesterday there's three high-risk groups for atypical presentations of women. Elderly, no surprise, diabetes, no surprise, and women, which oftentimes is a surprise. More often than men, they'll have painless presentations. They'll have atypical locations for pain. Like I said, isolated upper abdominal pain, isolated arm pain, isolated neck pain, but not the classic Hollywood crushing substernal chest pressure. Atypical symptoms, for example, unexplained shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is a very common anginal equivalent in patients that are not having pain. So if you have some type of policy in your ER whereby anyone who shows up with chest pain gets a quick EKG, you should include shortness of breath with that. Anybody who shows up with shortness of breath, especially elderly women, diabetics, anybody who has shortness of breath without a clear-cut cause, like obvious asthma, wheezing everywhere, check an EKG on those patients, unless there's an obvious asthmatic attack or something else. And you'll be surprised how often it turns out that that's ischemia. Other symptoms, flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting for no good reason, just feeling really weak and worn out and tired. Doc, I think I've got the flu. I just feel really worn out. I've got some nausea. I'm a little bit achy all over. One of the ironies here is that studies have shown that women tend to present with more symptoms than men. Men tend to present with, say, just chest pain and sweats. Well, that's a piece of cake. No one's, no one's going to miss an EKG there or maybe just chest pain and shortness of breath, or chest pain that's radiating down the arm. Those are pretty easy. Everyone's gonna pick up on ACS there. But women tend to present with more symptoms that may be atypical. So instead of the Hollywood pressure with diaphoresis, maybe just some nausea and fatigue and achiness and a little bit of shortness of breath. And ironically, because women present with more symptoms, they're more likely to be misdiagnosed as the flu. So the flu becomes a relatively common misdiagnosis in women, all right? 
isolated fatigue. Mom usually has so much energy, but this morning she just couldn't get out of bed. She had no energy. Usually she eats a big breakfast, but this morning she just had no appetite. I'm not really sure why. She wasn't doing anything special last night. Just has no energy. You know what? Just check an EKG. I'm not saying that you need to send troponins or activate the cath lab. All I'm asking you to do is just check a 12 lead, and you may be surprised at what you end up seeing. All right? And this is not just older women. This is younger women also. And this is a study that, for those of us that are boarded in EM, this was one of the LLSA required ratings from ABEM a number of years ago. It was a study where they surveyed a lot of women that had ACS, and they said, what type of symptoms were you having before the ACS? And take a look at these numbers. Only 30% of the women had any chest pain before the ACS. Now, that's a little bit of an outlier. Most other studies do say that the majority of women have some chest pain. All right? So that's a bit of an outlier. But take a look at some of these other numbers. 40% of women were reporting primarily shortness of breath. Sleep disturbance, 48%. I just didn't sleep well last night. I'm not really sure why. 71% had unexplained fatigue. I'm really wiped out today. I didn't do anything special yesterday. I just have no energy this morning. You know, beware that fatigue. You know, I'll say that as I've become, I've said this before, as I've become more experienced in emergency medicine, and in fact, as I've become more experienced in life, I've come to fear tired women. I'll just leave it at that, all right? So check an EKG. If I see any women here yawning, you're getting an EKG, right? So, yeah, question. Is, uh, I've actually heard other people say that it's more medical legally defensible to not order an EKG and that if you order the EKG you could get asked the doctor you were suspicious enough of ACS to order an EKG in that patient why didn't you complete your investigation with components because the sensitivity of the EKG is like 30% sure okay great point so the question is if if you get an EKG are you obligating yourselves to go all the way down the path and I would say I, I would completely disagree and I would say every attorney on either side that I've ever met would completely disagree that issue starts coming up when you start ordering troponins so an EKG in general is almost considered an extension of the physical exam because it's so liberally ordered troponins become a little bit bigger issue what I've seen in many cases is somebody sends a troponin and then the issue comes up. Well, you ordered troponins, you must have had some concern. So troponins becomes a bigger issue. I've never, ever, 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 ever seen or heard somebody say, you got an EKG, therefore you should have gone all the way. Far more often, I've heard people say, look, you know that there's atypical presentations. Why couldn't you just order an EKG? So I would say, don't think, about, don't think twice about ordering EKGs. Maybe think twice about whether troponins ought to be sent if you're really not worried and document really well. The bigger issue comes up with misinterpreted EKGs, and we'll get to that in just a bit. All right, great question. Thanks for asking that. All right, what about alt alternative locations? Not everybody has chest pain. Upper abdominal pain we mentioned yesterday. Upper abdominal pain I'm starting to see more often as well as a presentation of ACS in the med mal literature and in cases. Please consider upper abdominal pain, upper, the upper abdomen part of the chest. Remember the diaphragm is not a concrete wall. So anything in the chest can produce upper abdominal pain just the way upper, abdom, uh, upper abdominal issues can produce chest pain. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to work up everybody who's got pancreatitis and severe tenderness, but the key point here that I'm making is if somebody comes in complaining of upper abdominal pain and they don't have tenderness that explains it, a fairly non-tender abdomen, Doc, my upper abdomen is really hurting, but you push on it. No, it's not really hurting when you push on it. It just hurts, though. Those are the patients in whom you check a 12-lead EKG. All right, if there's no significant tenderness that explains their complaint, check a 12 lead. And again, that's become more common, especially in the elderly. 12% of elderly who are having ACS present with upper abdominal pain instead of chest pain. So think about that 12 lead. This is a great case here. This was a relatively young woman, 30 some years old, who had known history of gallstones. And she came into the emergency department complaining of upper abdominal pain and a little bit of nausea. So it's midday time, the doc said, oh, she's got gallstones, she's got upper abdominal pain and some nausea, it's clearly cholestitis. They pushed on the belly, it really wasn't that tender. The documentation was minimal, if any, tenderness, all right? But, you know, they, they get a quick bedside ultrasound, yeah, there's gallstones, there's no real sludge, maybe we can imagine a little bit, I don't know, it's, it's, there's no sonographic Murphy sign, but she's got gallstones in there. So she's got gallstones, upper abdominal pain, so they're tunnel visualing, this has to be cholecystitis, they call surgery. 
Surgery comes down and says, her, well, the OR is available. Let's take her gallbladder out. So she gets some pre-op stuff, including this pre-op EKG, which nobody looked at. The emergency physicians didn't. The surgeons didn't. Not sure what that good would have done anyway. And the anesthesiologists didn't look at it either. Nobody looked at the CKG. They took her up to the operating room and on the OR table under the stress of getting an operative procedure, she coded and died. And then afterwards, they're reviewing her records and they found the EKG and said, oh my God, she was having an inferior STEMI the entire time. That was her upper abdominal pain. All right? Nobody saw the EKG. Even the machine read this as an inferior STEMI. All right? But nobody looked at it. All right? So please remember upper abdominal pain as a manifestation of ACS when they don't have significant tenderness. And you'll see this with other thoracic problems also. I've seen upper abdominal pain with lower lobe PEs, lower lobe pneumonia, um, pleural effusions, and so on. So anything in the thorax can produce upper abdominal pain and vice versa. It says, Your Honor, before we settle on a judgment amount, we'd like to know how much money there is in the universe. That's probably the way that, uh, that trial turned out. All right. Next, over-reliance on troponins. So here's the troponin issue. Over-reliance on troponins. It's really become a troponin society. Our residents and junior doctors, everybody wants to send troponins on, on everything. Anything that moves, boom, get a troponin. All right? Well, this is a great study that I just wanted to mention, a key point here. This is from out of JAMA where they looked at all different predictors of ACS. They looked at all the labs. One of the major points that came out of this article was this very simple concept. Biomarker negative ACS still exists. In other words, you can definitely still have ACS with negative troponins. Remember, troponins are a sign of myocardial death. If somebody's simply having ischemia right now, you can't necessarily rely on troponins. Even the most highly sensitive troponins, I mean, troponins now are so sensitive that they start turning positive like a day before the heart attack happens. It's ridiculous, right? Um, and they're so, and high sensitivity also means low specificity. One of my favorite studies on troponins, I'm going off on a tangent now, but one of my favorite troponin studies was one where they, they ran troponins on people finishing um, uh, a 20 kilometer race. I think it was 20 kilometers. And the vast majority of patients, or people, runners, had market elevations of troponins. And these are incredibly healthy people. None of them are dropping dead of ACS. Any type of myocardial stress can bump these troponins, but not reliably, unless they infarct the myocytes, unless there's myocardial death. And on top of that, even the most highly sensitive troponins still take a few hours to start rising, a couple of hours. Here's a great case, this was sent to me uh, actually, where is it? Well, I'll get to it in the, in the EKG section. Just to really, really hammer home the fact that troponins are not going to nail your diagnosis. And again, if you think about every accelerated diagnostic protocol, the heart score, the Timmy score, the ADAPT score, the revised Vancouver chest pain rule, the EDAC score, all of these validated scoring systems that people around the world are using, every validated scoring system involves three things. History, troponins and EKG. No, there's no validated score that's ever just said all you need is troponins. And what we're seeing in the MedMal literature, again, in MedMal cases, is a lot of people are sending off troponins which are negative and then obviating their concerns about the EKG or the history. You can't obviate a concerning HPI just because the troponins are negative. And again, my personal experience has been probably, I would say, half the med mal cases I see have negative troponins on the chart. Half of them have negative troponins on the chart, which means somebody got some troponins and said, troponins are negative, I'm done, I don't need to worry. The patient goes home and drops dead, all right? In some of those cases, even the EKGs were very abnormal, but people said, I don't need to worry about the EKG, the troponins are negative, we're off the hook. You're not off the hook with negative troponins. If there's a concerning HPI or a concerning EKG or a concerning troponin, you're on the hook. So there's three factors, not just troponins. Please don't rely on troponins 100%. All right? All right. Again, if you're using accelerated diagnostic protocol, as an aside, make sure that you're using it exactly the way it was written. This is another thing that we'll see sometimes. A lot of people here raised their hand and said they're using the heart score. If you're using the heart score, use the heart score the way it was intended to be used. 
We see some people that just kind of, they go rogue with it. They start coming up with their own numbering systems and things like that. And, and I'll tell you, every attorney out there that I've met knows the heart score. Every attorney. They all know the heart score. And they'll ask you if you're using the heart score. They'll ask you if your department is using the heart score, if you've endorsed use of the heart score or Timmy or whatever. And then they'll pull it into the trial and say, well, let's go through each aspect of the heart score. How many points did you give for H? How many points did you give for E? How many points did you give for A? And so on. And what happens oftentimes is people just kind of gestalt it. They say, ah, oh, the heart score, yeah, it's, it's under three. I can send them home. But then when you actually start adding up the points, it's four or five or six, and that person's not going home. So, yeah, go ahead. Sure, use of serial troponins in, tell you what, um, later this afternoon, we're going to talk about chest pain risk stratification. And if I don't answer it there, maybe we can uh, address that question then. All right, thanks. All right. So question, any other questions so far before we switch over to EKGs? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the EKG, right? We talked a lot about the EKG yesterday. We'll talk just a little bit more. Again, this is something I mentioned yesterday. In my experience of looking at these med mal cases, probably close to 50% of cases that, that are referred to me, which is a little bit of a biased group, uh, probably about 50% have abnormal EKGs. And I'm not talking about subtle junk, you know, non-specific T wave flattening. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about clear-cut ST depression where your computer miscalls it, but you shouldn't have miscalled it. Where people, the kind of cases where you look back at the EKG and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed that when you just look a little bit more closely, all right? Don't rely on your computer, key point number one. Your computer is programmed by people who are trying to fool you, all right? I don't know who they are, maybe they're played by, paid by plaintiff attorneys, all right? But your computer is completely untrustworthy. Don't trust your computer, maybe for the intervals, but that's about it. Let me show you a handful of cases. A couple of these I showed last night. Take a look. The computer up here calls this non-specific. What is it on this EKG that has you worried? What lead? V2. Biphasic T wave in V2 and a hint of it in V3. What's that called? Wellens. That's Wellens. This is a highly specific finding. It's not non-specific. It's highly specific for a proximal LAD occlusion. And this patient got discharged and ended up infarcting and coming back in cardiogenic shock, all right? Here's another case. Once again, there's the computer called this nonspecific. And by the way, this is a 20-some-year-old guy who got better with Malox. So the physician discharged him, EKG, computer called it nonspecific, the physician called it nonspecific. He's got that biphasic T wave V2 and an inverted T wave V3. He's got Wellens also. The physician discharged him, the guy had a massive MI, came back during that same physician's night shift, hours later in, in cardiac arrest. And that same physician who discharged him a few hours ago had to run a code and then pronounce him dead. Here's another one, 27 year old, I showed this to you yesterday. 27 years old, right? Too young to have ACS. The computer's calling this early repolarization, which is very common in a young person, but early repolarization should not have a flip T wave and ST segment sagging in AVL. Remember from yesterday, you flip T wave in AVL, what's this predicting? Inferior wall STEMI, right? An hour later, here's the EKG. And the initial computer read was nothing more than simply early repoll. All right, here's another one. Take a look at that. Normal EKG, but the abnormality, again, flip T wave and ST segment sagging in AVL, which predicts his inferior wall STEMI which picked up about 15 minutes later. Here's another one. This was one of my cases. And there's your AVL finding again, flip T wave in lead AVL. The computer completely ignores that and just call the EKG pretty much normal. Science Brady, normal EKG. But we know a flip T wave in AVL is not normal. So we get some serial EKGs and about 45 minutes later, he's got a massive inferior wall STEMI. You cannot rely on your computer to make your diagnosis. Here's a 32-year-old who already had rising troponins and a 95% left main disease. The computer called this 
rock-solid, normal EKG. Just a little bit of sinus bradycardia with a rate of 59. Take a look at those ST segment depressions in 2, 3, and AVF. The computer's calling this normal. And there's hyperacute T waves in V2 and V3. There's no way you can rely on the computer. Your computer is intended to fool you. Don't trust your computer interpretation. All right? And very often what happens is these cases go to medical malpractice and then the physician looks back at the EKG without looking at the interpretation and again says, I can't believe I missed that. Now you never want to say that in court, but <laughs> when you're talking to your attorney, you say, I can't believe I missed that. Right? Lack of scrutiny is a very, very common mistake. Right? Especially in young patients and women who right off the bat, we've already assumed it can't be ACS. So we, we're looking at the EKG already assuming it's not ACS. So we're already biased because we've been taught young women and young patients in general don't have ACS. All right? Here's another one. I showed this to you a few minutes ago. Because the patient was young, the cardiologist blew this off as pericarditis. The emergency physician pushed and pushed and pushed, and this, sure enough, was an inferior wall STEMI. All right? Here's another young person. This is from a med mal case that was settled for upper six figures. This is a 45-year-old woman. So this is the classic demographic for which I see the med mal cases, relatively young women. Premenopausal, premenopausal women aren't supposed to have cardiac disease. That's what I was taught. Well, she had some atypical chest pain, and the EKG machine up there says nonspecific. So the physician got this EKG. It's got a poor baseline, as you see. It was never repeated. And because it's nonspecific EKG, nonspecific symptoms, because she's so young and had no known cardiac risk factors at that time, she ends up being discharged home. A couple days later, she collapsed in front of her kids in the kitchen, came back, cardiac arrest, pronounced dead. This goes to litigation. And then when you take a closer look at a couple of those leads, what the attorneys do is they take the EKG, they blow it up in front of the jury so everybody can see it in eight by 10 foot format and anybody can appreciate that in leads V2, V3, V4, there's clearly almost a full millimeter of ST depression that anybody could have picked up. But it wasn't picked up because the machine called it nonspecific and it had a poor baseline. The physician never bothered to repeat it. And that jury, what the attorney says is, V3 and V4, these are the LAD leads. Those are the Widowmaker leads. Everybody knows what the Widowmaker is, right? The LAD, right? Anybody should have picked this up. By the way, your, your computers, your EKG machines are programmed to call things nonspecific when there's less than a millimeter of elevation or depression. So if you have 0.999 millimeters of elevation all across the precordium, your computer will call it nonspecific. It won't call it a STEMI. If you have 0.9 millimeters of ST depression all across the precordium, your computer won't call it ischemia. It'll call it nonspecific. It's not until it's a full millimeter or more that your computer will pick it up and call it positive for something. So don't ever trust the words nonspecific. And what I would suggest is don't ever trust normal either. So this case got settled for a lot, a lot of money because <clears throat> it wasn't possible to defend that EKG mystery. Questions so far? <clears throat> All right. So what else? Ignoring the EKG because of negative troponin. So here's a case I was referring to. Take a look at this EKG. This is sent from a, uh, a friend down in Florida. All right. So this is a 90-year-old woman who comes in with chest pain, nausea, shortness of breath. All of the EKG, all of the ST segment changes you see up there are completely new. All right, so this is a slam dunk admission. No one's arguing about this. But I show this to you because this patient had two negative troponins six hours apart. Can you rely on troponins? Absolutely not. You know, you can't assume that troponins are always going to be positive. She had diffuse cardiac ischemia, but simply hadn't infarcted yet. So her troponins were negative. You think serial troponins are going to help? Troponins six hours apart still were negative. Right? So remember, your ADPs are history, EKG, and troponins, not just troponin. Can't just obviate all your concerns with troponin. The last thing I'm going to talk about in the last couple of minutes or so has to do with serial, well, not this type of serial, but serial EKGs. We talked a lot about serial testing yesterday. Failure to repeat the EKG is often a pitfall that shows up. 
in the MedMal literature. Failure to repeat. If the first EKG is poor quality, remember the EKG I showed you a few minutes ago that was a wavy baseline, you've got to repeat it. Don't settle for a suboptimal EKG. If there's a lot of artifact, maybe the patient's a little tremulous. Once they chill out a bit, get another EKG a little bit later on. But don't settle for suboptimal EKGs. Your license is hanging on the line, depending on that. And the patient's life is hanging on the line. So repeat them if you get a poor quality. The other thing that we're supposed to do is get repeat EKGs. If the patient has concerning symptoms and your EKG is not diagnostic, get a repeat EKG. All right? In fact, the ACC AHA national guidelines say we're supposed to get repeat EKGs every 15 to 30 minutes for the first hour. That's what the national guidelines say. Now, I'll go on record as saying I think that's ridiculous. I don't think that most, emergency, most busy emergency departments have the resources and personnel and EKG machines to be repeating EKGs four times per hour. All right? But what I would say is reasonable is that if your patient has some concerning symptoms, and I'm not talking about the squirrely chest pain who's just texting and asking for some Dilaudid and a turkey sandwich. I'm talking about, you know, you're worried about this patient. All right, so you've all seen that patient also, all right? <laughs> so you're worried about this patient. They're concerning sim symptoms, but the first EKG is not diagnostic. Get at least one more EKG in the next hour. I think that's reasonable, that's doable. Just one more in the next hour. All right, if that repeat EKG is unremarkable, unchanged, then we'll all feel better about it. But you'll see some of those evolve into STEMIs or into diagnostic findings, all right? So just get one more. If they have ongoing chest pain, get a repeat. If their chest pain changes, maybe now they're starting to get diaphoresis and now it's radiating down the arm, it's changing, get another one. If their chest pain goes away, I suggest getting another one. Because if you see evolving changes with versus without pain, that's a slam dunk admission for ACS. If something's evolving, that's a slam dunk call to cardiology that something's evolving there, all right? An important thing to know, when you look at national databases, big, big national databases, up to 20% of STEMIs are not diagnosed on the first EKG. Up to 20% of, of STEMIs are diagnosed on the repeat EKG. So if you're not repeating EKGs, you might be missing as many as 15 to 20% of your STEMI patients. So you've got to get repeat EKGs when the patient has concerning symptoms and your first one's not diagnostic. All right, I think that's simple enough, just get one more. Every 15 to 30 minutes, great, but most of us can't do that. So quick take home points about the history again. Make sure to do a good history and please document a good history. If you've got templated systems like the, the T-Sheet or Epic or whatever, go through it. Ask the questions and answer the questions and document those questions, all right? And please don't exclude ACS purely based on reflux symptoms, purely based on young age, purely based on gender, purely based on abdominal pain, or based on negative troponins and use your accelerated diagnostic protocols properly. Don't go rogue with them. And then with regards to the EKG, really take some time to look at that EKG, 20 seconds. With every EKG that comes across your desk, please don't look at the interpretation. I'm convinced that if we eliminated all computer interpretations, there would be less malpractice. And there's actually a very nice cardiology review, review article from the Journal of Emergency Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which essentially tested to the same concept, that a lot of malpractice cases occur because people stare at that interpretation and are biased when they then look down at the EKG. Don't look at it. Or turn it off. Fold it over. Look at the EKG first before you ever look at that interpretation so you're not biased. All right? Don't trust the computer. And get serial EKGs. Don't settle for bad quality EKGs and get serial EKGs if the pain is still persisting.